for investors by investors. You're listening to the only show on the planet for real real estate investors, wholesalers, rehabbers, landlords, private lenders, cash buyers, fix and flippers. This is Real Estatepreneurs. Welcome back to another show, boys and girls. Glad to have you here. And we are switching things up. Old Nate Kennedy is traveling. Nate Doggy Dog is traveling. So you're stuck with Dr. J, but I'm not going to carry this all by myself. I have got a guest today. And this is somebody that you guys out there, you real real estate investors, the guys that are doing deals, the guys that want to grow, the guys that want to scale, you've got to pay attention to today's episode. I have Robert Nickel. What is up, brother? Hey, man. So excited to be here. Really appreciate your time. I'm loving the show. Yeah, yeah, man. So I know our teams put us together because we were out there looking for the best of the best to, to bring to the real estatepreneurs. But I love what you guys are doing. And I am actually, I built an entire business this way. And so it's kind of fun because I've got a lot of assistants across the world. And I had that dream, the dream that we all had like seven, eight, ten, I don't know how many years ago, when Tim Ferriss told us we could have these muse businesses and we could live on the beach with, with our feet kicked up, sipping a Corona and have people all around the world working for us while we collected the paychecks. Now, it didn't turn out that way for me at first. <laughs> and that's what I want to talk about with you because you said you'd be open to sharing some of the nightmares. And a lot of people do have nightmares in hiring virtual assistants. And I want to start off right now with one nightmare story. Like, give me one of the worst things that you overcame so we can set the bar really low. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I didn't grow up. When I was a kid, I didn't, people would ask me in my, you know, when you got the coloring books and they say, hey, what do you want to be as an adult? I wasn't writing down, hey, I'd like to own a virtual assistant staffing company. I would like to solve people's biggest problems, which is usually systems and processes and then having the right people to execute that and being able to leverage other people's time. I didn't grow up with this concept of like, yeah, let's solve the management problems and the people problems that people face and having the business they actually set out and intended to create after they read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or Tim Ferriss' book, or Red E-Myth, and know they need to scale that ladder to entrepreneur. You never start out with this idea of, I want to solve the people problems, right? So my journey started with a whole lot of people problems in my real estate business. I was at first a rehabber because I didn't know what wholesaling was initially until about 2011. So from 2008 to 2010, I was just doing rehabbing. And then started wholesaling in 2011, which seemed amazing because talking about people problems, I was terrible at managing contractors and dealing with the rehabs. Every individual rehab seemed like a full-time job to me because managing the process to get that done. And then if you need, you know, in a transaction business, like we're in, in real estate, to get another deal, I had to go through the process all over. You got to market, you got to talk to sellers, you have to set appointments, you have to go on those appointments, you have to get a contract, you have to work with the title company, go contract to close. And then if you're going to wholesale it, somebody's got to go through the effort to, to actually buy. Sometimes buyers want to see the property, do a walkthrough. You have to go then do the dog and pony show with the buyers, right? So going through that process, doing it all by myself is what led me to the idea of ultimately wanting to bring somebody to help me out, right? So the first people problems I had were bringing my friends and family uh. into my office to help me with the day to day. And I was terrible at that. I am- Well, wait a second. Why were you terrible at that? Were you letting them run you or what was the, what was the situation yeah, that, there? That there could not be a better explanation of that. Yes, I got ran every day. So I had a business that ran me every day. I went to bed feeling sick every night and woke up feeling guilty. I didn't want to walk into the office. I didn't want to deal with it. I, I felt like I was getting subpar work for the amount that I was paying and then motivating and driving people to outcomes and actually to do their jobs and the day-to-day -day stuff. I really didn't like having people in my office at all. Well, let's talk about those people in particular. How long till you woke up and said, because I made the same mistake. That's why I want to talk about this because my first hires were like my dad and my brother and stuff like that. So how long till you kick those people out and how do you do it gracefully? 18 to 24 months. And I was really fortunate in that the relationships that I had were really strong before we were working together. 
while we were working together, pretty honest, open relationship as, as much as can be. So when it came time for separation, it was pretty clear for both parties that it would be in everyone's best interest to, to separate at that time. So I was pretty lucky that for most pieces, relatively mutual agreement to separate. But that to me wasn't the pain had it The pain was the idea of motivating people, the idea of, you know, every time something came up, whether it's kids at school or someone getting sick or my car's tire, I need to get some, my oil change. So I was like, well, I so what? Like, I don't, you know, like, I know it sounds terrible, but like. <laughs> no I, empathy, I, eh? Get to work. I, right, but it's like eight to five. It's like, like, you still want a full paycheck. Right? They, everybody still wants a full salary. Everybody still wants benefits. Everybody wants to have a new Mac computer when they start work. Everybody wants all of these things. You've got to have a desk and office space. And taxes are expensive. Even if you're doing an independent contractor, then it's like, well, am I breaking the rules all the time? How do I structure this person? Am I allowed to tell them what to do? Not technically, but not by the letter of the law, right? Controlling people's time and telling them what to work on and when to show up and having eight to five. It's, I wasn't good at it, to be honest with you. I was not, not good at that process. And, and I just became a pushover for the most part. If people were like, hey, I'm gonna take an extended lunch, I was like, hey, I'd say okay in my head. I'd be like, you know, there'd be some cuss words flying in my head. Like, gosh, dang it. Like, you know, somebody's gotta do, somebody's gotta answer the phone. And there's nothing more painful than when I was meeting with sellers and I was trying to get a contract because that's, to me, was, I felt like best use of my time was actually meeting with sellers and trying to get contracts. And all the other things were important, but they were ancillary. They weren't best use of my time. There's nothing more frustrating than get back to the car and having three missed calls and only one of them left a voicemail. And then I, on the next appointment, I would call, you know, try to call back and have a conversation writing really terrible notes. And so by the my day, it was just, I would just get the ones I could knock down. And that was three or four a month, really. That's what it was. And for a while, I was like, fine with, okay, I'm not going to hire people because I'm clearly a bad manager. Um, and <laughs> I so <give> up. <laughs> I, I can work 60, 70 hours a week and do three to five transactions. Unless I got lucky one month and I, you know, met the investor who's older and transitioning and had 10 rundown properties all at the same time where I could do a package deal and have a great month. But other than that, I was consistently three or four deals just running through walls every single day. So how do you break out of that then? Because you, you had the bad experience and like all of us, I've done it too, where I'm like, I'm just not going to do that anymore. And then you, you pick up all the slack. I mean, where do you say, all right, enough, I got to try something different here. This is crazy. Well, so I got tired of the, it didn't matter that I was doing so much better money wise than my W2 that I had no freedom, really. And what I learned was, and I know it sounds cheesy, but the truth for me was I learned that I actually cared about my time and my freedom more than I really cared about money. Money to me was only fun if I had time and freedom because just having it and sitting there, I almost resented the money I made in my real estate business because I was just in the office all the time grinding. And I see everybody's Facebook names and all the posts they make about, you know, like rise and grind. And I'm like, is, oh. that, is that the point? Is that why we got F it? you. Is the <laughs> 4 a.m. gym selfies every day? Is that, you know, like that's the only time you can get some me time is for 4 to 4 45 in the morning. I was like, is that the, is that what? And to be honest with you, I went and met with my broker because I kind of, I was ready to go back to a W-2 job and work for a whole lot less money, but be able to kind of have some control of my life, which is a weird thing to say, let me go work for somebody else so that I can have more. But man, when you're working as many hours as I was working and real estate, it's not sexy anymore when it's a job. It's not HGTV where everything just goes right and it's this emotional Right. It's like super fun. And at the end, we all hug it out and get to bro it out and high five. It's like, great. We all made money. We're so happy. Let's go do Christmas together. It's work. It's a job. It was hard. So I was burned out. I kind of, I was at a crossroads. What am I going to do? I wanted some more consistency. And I went and met with my broker. Texas is a non-disclosure state. So if you want to run comps and get accurate uh, valuations, you have to have access to the MLS. So my broker, he was a lifestyle guy. He has three kids. 
and uh, he does what his kids do. So when his daughter's playing golf, he's caddying for golf tournaments. When the youngest one likes technology and stuff, so he's like building computers, knows he's right in there with him doing his things. And so if a t-ball game or a baseball game or whatever's coming up, he was there and he was involved and he was. So he liked. He, you know, he likes his deer lease, he likes his truck, he likes having some things too, but really those things were just tools, they're vehicles in his lifestyle. And so his business was built to generate and create the life that he wanted. And so to me, that's what it was really all about. So I went from this hustle and grind, let's make as much money as I could while having zero time whatsoever and waking up every day in chaos with my hair on fire and then going to bed feeling guilty because I feel like you never got quite enough done to go in and having conversation with him. And he said, hey man, you've got the same number of hours in a day as everyone else. We all have the same number of hours a day. And I'm not gonna listen to you bitch moan and complain about how much you're working and how much you're doing. It just means you're doing it wrong. And he says, there's lots of big companies out there who have grown to be very successful and done lots of things and they figured it out. And you know how to leverage other people's money because that's how you do rehabs. I wasn't using my own money to do three, four, five rehabs at a time. I was going and borrowing private money and, and sometimes hard money to do rehab. So using other people's money was something I was, that made all the sense in the world to me from the very beginning. And then he was the one that told me, you've got to leverage other people's time. You're prospecting, you're marketing, you're doing all of these things, but it doesn't mean you have to answer the phone. It doesn't mean you have to run comps. It doesn't mean you have to fill out contracts and post it on the MLS and answer the phone when a buyer calls and asks you the same questions that are listed on the email packet that they called you from, right? It's amazing <laughs> that how that happens. It's like, you just called me because I sent you an email and everything you're asking me is listed in the email. It's just like, Bleh. but people want to have those phone conversations. They want to talk. So you can say, look at my email or you can put an auto responder that says, I checked my email from one to three, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'll get back to you when I can because my time's more important than yours. You can do that, or you can create an experience. You can craft an experience for my buyers were important to me. And if they wanted to ask me silly questions, really because it just made them feel better, then somebody needed to answer their silly questions and make them feel good so that we could create the transaction, right? So that was really the aha. I was down in the gutter feeling... I was pouting, really, feeling <laughs> myself. And I went and visited my broker, who was older, much more successful, and, and obviously much wiser than I was. And he was using virtual assistants from the Philippines to do most everything in the day to day. 80 to 90% of the real estate business is done on the phone. And so he had it very simply mapped out and clear roles and defined responsibilities for people. There was a script for every person that was on the phone. There was a process map for every person who's doing admin work. He shared with me all of those documents and that was the foundation for ultimately building what I think is the most successful and best virtual staffing company for real estate operators in the world is it came from all of my pain points in the day to day. I know how important lead management is. You need, you need somebody who's a killer on the phone, a rock star at empathy. You said, you know, no empathy. Yeah, the person on the phone's got to have empathy and they have to have some emotional intelligence and communicate well and carry a conversation because we all know that that seller conversation is about why they're looking to sell so that we know if we need to spend more time with them, are we ultimately going to get this house at a discount or does it fit our strategy? You know, some people can buy retail these days and hotel those out or whatever it may be with a turnkey strategy. But whatever your strategy is, you've got to really get down and have a real conversation with the seller. They're not just giving you thumbs up, thumbs down. So that filtering process has to be a competent person. The person who's doing your admin, your, your title work, like they've got to be competent. They have to know the things. And so instead of what really happened was I took that platform from my broker, I formalized it, and I just started helping people do it. I was part of masterminds, I was part of different groups that, you know, we know some common people that like, I just meet people at different groups and meetups because I don't think I'm the smartest guy, I don't think I have all the answers, but there's a lot of really smart people that are doing really cool things that I want to learn from. So it started as something we just helping people in 2011, 2012. In 2013, we formalized all of the systems and processes where we can carry anybody, any operator, 
through, if they're honest and sincere about running your real business, then we start with the discovery phase that maps out your whole business. We provide you with that, whatever tools or resources from a system standpoint that you need. And then we find the right people from our platform that to fill those roles and job descriptions. And that's kind of the too long art, too long story. I've been talking too much, but that, that's really the full story, you know, of how I went from hating my life because I'm a terrible manager to having some really wise people show me a better path, understanding that we were all kind of in the same boat. All my, everybody that I knew in all these groups, we all struggled with the same thing. Like we, business is easy. We know how to negotiate with sellers. We know how to do all the stuff. But having a machine that can run without us doing every single thing, that's the hard part, right? So we feel like we enable any honest investor about running a real business because it takes some effort. You know, you, there's, I've never come across anything where you just press a button and money went into your bank account. But those that are running a real business, there's just with technology today, the resources that are available and the talent that's available, you can truly be like Dr. J here, anybody. <laughs> build, build a business to serve your lifestyle, which I'm 100% confident is why we all got in the big business. Yeah, yeah. But uh, what most of us do is build a business for a psychopath boss who never gives us time off and underpays us and undervalues us <laughs> till we're out there trying to get a job just to get away from the business we created. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, right. But that's what's cool about when you do start creating your own business and whether, you know, we all have different problems at different scale, but you get to control that. And if you're, if you're building a real platform, putting systems and processes in place that are repeatable and putting quality talent in place to do that, it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't, you don't have to hire uh, PhDs or MBAs from all these fancy universities. I mean, there's a lot of really talented people across the world that just have different opportunity than you and I do, being so, you know, hashtag blessed here in the United States with just all the things that were afforded. It's just different in different parts of the world. So technology has really bridged that gap. So the day-to-day -day things that used to be only big companies could outsource and only big companies could leverage other people's times and do things that is so readily available now. Now, smaller operations doing very few transactions. The average realtor, for example, does less than 11 transactions a year. Wow. But though, even those realtors, even if you're not a super volume person, you're not looking to make millions and millions of dollars, you can run a very good business where the vast majority of it is done by other people, like VAs, where you're, where you're only involved where you want to be involved, wherever your genius zone is, whatever kind of gets you going. And everything else can be done from a competent person. I thought there was no way I could hire a lead manager from the Philippines to accurately represent my business and work my leads well and not sound like an idiot and do a good job and do as good as I could. And that was the first thing that I ultimately delegated and outsourced. And it was the best thing I ever did because I could immediately spend more money on marketing and get more leads coming into the business because I had somebody working the phones and I started doing more transactions right away, which paid for that person's salary. And that's what, once I did that, and I saw that it was possible to do that, then the rest of it honestly became quite a bit easier because the admin task, as long as you write down step-by-step -step what's going on, which our teams do for our client partners, is actually create step-by-step -step the systems and processes for them. Most people don't have that, right? But with the admin, that's what it's about. So if you can get somebody, if I, I it, like my confidence, I was just, my confidence went through the roof. And from there, I just started systematically taking everything else out of the day that wasn't best use of my time. Buyers are going to call you if you're wholesaling houses and you email out, you blast the property out, you're going to get phone calls. So I wanted somebody to answer those calls and treat people right. So I just started systematically saying, okay, what would be the best experience for everybody that we're interacting with? Title companies in our buyers list and our sellers. How do we make everybody feel like hey, this company, they have it going on. We want to work with these guys because they care about us. They're competent. They know what they're doing. They're going to do what they say. And the only way we were able to give that confidence to people and look like something much bigger than we were is because I was able to take things like lead manager and someone to run comps and someone to do these things. So I wasn't dropping the ball. 
the title company sent an email asking for my corporate docs, the articles of organization, all the things you have to send to close a deal. Instead of getting frustrated because I already emailed it to her the first time that I sent the contract over with a copy of the check and explaining everything to her, it's all already there. I can act like I'm frustrated with her and tell her it's already there. Or I can just have somebody very professionally, kindly respond with all the stuff and wish them a great day. And now I get referrals from the title company because I not only close transactions there, but I treat their people really well as well through our experience because I've outsourced and delegated those tasks so that we, we now look like we're a professional sharp company and it's somebody in the Philippines making $10 an hour running the, it's 80% of the day to day is done on a phone or computer. Wow. So you know what? I find this interesting because I've, through the years I have, worked with a lot of outsourcers, a lot of VAs, a lot of contractors, Upwork, Elance, all of that. And I haven't looked, but I feel like there's probably some hesitation, especially from the real estate preneurs out there to say, you really have a Filipino answering your calls. Does that not turn off these Americans or, or what? Yeah, well, so um, English proficiency and communication skills are obviously massively important. And one of the cool things about the Philippines, it's not the only country, but it's one of the primary reasons we recruit out of the Philippines is English is a national language there. And education is really strong. It's just their GDP. Uh, the dollar conversion rate is so different than it is here that you can get college educated people that speak perfect English that can do a great job. They're looking for an opportunity the same way people are here in the States, you can absolutely find someone that can do an amazing job on the phone. And we have people in every MSA across the country multiple times over working lead management. And if you look at the biggest operators in the country, from the publicly traded REITs down to the hedge funds that are doing hundreds of transactions in multiple markets, some of them may or may not be using our teams. And some of them, uh, and all of them are using virtual teams they're all using them on the front end on the lead generation for sure. So lead management, all the pipeline stuff, so managing sellers, talking the whole front end piece. There's not a large real estate operator that's doing hundreds of transactions that's not doing it this way. So, no kidding. Inside information. I mean, come on. So think about this, right? It's not really that hard to think about because almost every market, it's like if I ask you, hey, is your market, raise your hand if your market's competitive. Every single person raised your hand, right? Selling smart. It's not like to, when I first started wholesaling I, and, and rehabbing, I walked around like I knew something about real estate. I was, like, I was peacocking around 2010 like I'm a smart guy, right? 2013, 14, I, I couldn't hardly buy a house. With the exact, I was doing the exact same thing. All of a sudden, my 30,000 mailers went, they weren't getting me anything. I, was, I went from King Kong to <laughs> half a percent response rate because wow. it's so competitive and the market changed. So in super competitive tight markets, which is every viable MSA in the United States today is competitive. There's not a market where there's affordable housing, where there's not competition. Everybody's feeling it. And you can just go on and figure all the message boards, it's constant. That's what people are talking about. How to get creative to do deals and whatever, because just sending direct mail or some of these other strategies isn't going to just cut it and send a few letters a month. Anymore. So what's working now? So it seems like you might have some insight because I know you have. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed part one of this episode. It's just too good to limit to one show. Join us next week to hear the rest. This is the podcastfactory.com.